Chemical reactions can be organized into several different groups. One classic way of classifying different types of reactions is to categorize them as either a precipitation, acid-base, or a redox reaction. In this PowerPoint, we're going to examine the basic characteristics of precipitation reactions. Precipitation reactions are ones in which dissolved substances react to form one or more solid products. Here's an example. An aqueous solution of potassium iodide is mixed with one of lead nitrate. When these two clear solutions are mixed, they end up forming a yellow solid lead iodide. And in this beaker, you can actually see the lead iodide forming, coming out of solution and settling to the bottom. Remaining dissolved in the solution is the other product of the reaction, potassium nitrate. So precipitation reactions are often double displacement reactions. And what this means is that the cation of one of your reactants actually reacts or forms a bond with the anion of the other reactant. And the same thing happens for the remaining cation and anion. They end up switching places, in other words, or displacing each other to form new compounds. And in a precipitation reaction, one of those product compounds has to be a solid. So this characteristic pattern of a double displacement reaction and our understanding of the solubility rules that apply to ionic compounds allows us to often predict the products of a precipitation reaction. Precipitation reactions are driven by the relative solubility or insolubility of the products in water. In a previous PowerPoint, we said that ionic compounds are called electrolytes because they dissociate into ions when they dissolve in water. But not all ionic compounds will dissolve. There are several notable exceptions, and when these form as products of an aqueous reaction, they will precipitate out in solid form. This chart shows the identity of a variety of common water-soluble ionic compounds and their insoluble exceptions, and it's organized by the presence of cations and anions in the compound. Here's the way it works. Say that we wanted to know if our compound potassium chloride was soluble in water or not. We'd start by looking for either the cation or the anion in the solubility rules in the first column. So I'm looking for either potassium or chloride, and I find potassium right away in that very first row of the, of the table. So this says that compounds containing an alkali metal cation, like potassium, are generally water soluble. We do have to check if there are any exceptions to this rule. So we look over that row to the second column, and there are no exceptions. Any compound that contains an alkali metal cation is going to be soluble. So that means potassium chloride is soluble, and if this were written in a chemical reaction, I would place an AQ in parentheses after it. Let's look at another example, calcium phosphate. So again, we look for either calcium or cation or phosphate or anion in the first column of this table. And as I'm scanning over all of the different formulas for the different ions, I finally see phosphate down towards the bottom of the table. And it falls under the generally water insoluble compounds. So I look over to see if there's any exception. And when phosphate is paired with lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium, it can be soluble. But it doesn't say anything about calcium. So this indicates that calcium phosphate is insoluble. And in a chemical equation, I would place an S in parentheses after it. Let's look at one more example, calcium hydroxide. So again, I start by looking for my, either my cation, calcium, or my anion, hydroxide. And as I scan over all of the different formulas here, I finally find hydroxide 
the OH group down at the bottom. So again, we're in the water insoluble compounds. So I look over to the right to see if there are any exceptions. And sure enough, it turns out that hydroxide compounds that are paired with calcium are actually soluble. So this compound would have an AQ after it. So now we want to apply these solubility rules to a precipitation reaction to predict whether the products are actually soluble or insoluble. But the first step in a reaction like this one is to actually predict what the products are. If you're just given the reactants, you've got to figure out how they're going to switch places and form new products. So we know that most precipitation reactions are double displacement reactions. So what we're going to do is actually switch the places of the cations in each of these reactants to form new products. But it's really important that you get the correct formula for the products, which means that you really have to make sure you know the correct ion charges on both the cations and the anions when they combine into new compounds. So I find it easiest actually to first separate the reactants into their dissociated ions. And to do this, you have to remember your characteristic ion charges and what you know about charge balance, and in this case, polyatomic ions. So I know, for example, that potassium is a metal in column one of the periodic table, and all of the metals in column one form ions with a plus one charge. So I can separate my two potassium as 2K plus. The remainder of the formula, SO4, must be a polyatomic. So it is, it's a sulfate anion, and the four has to be attached to the oxygen. It's part of the sulfate formula. If I had multiple polyatomics, I would have had parentheses around that entire formula and a, a subscript outside of it. But since there are no parentheses, I can assume that this formula SO4 is complete as it is. And I can look up the charge on my polyatomic list, or I can reason it out because I know that I have two potassium ions with a plus one charge. To balance this out in the compound, my sulfate has to have a negative two charge. I then move over to my second compound and break it apart into its ions. So uh, barium is in column two of the periodic table and all of the metals in column two have a plus two charge. And chloride is in column 17 and all of the nonmetals in column 17 form a negative one charge when they form ions. Next, I'm going to actually switch the cations and write formulas for the products. So I'm going to combine my potassium with my chloride and write the formula that would result from that. And I'm also going to combine my barium with my sulfate. So remember that when you write an ionic compound formula, you always write the cation first, followed by the anion. And you always use the lowest whole number ratio for the cation and anion combination. So for potassium chloride, I have a plus one and a minus one charge on my cation and anion. That's a KCl. And for barium sulfate, I have a plus two and a minus two charge. So they're going to combine in a neutral compound in a one to one ratio. That's the lowest whole number ratio. So we have uh, barium sulfate, BaSO4. So I carried over the coefficient as well. Since I had two potassiums and two chlorides, um, but they're combined in a one-to-one -one ratio, the two actually goes as a coefficient outside of that. The next step is to look at my solubility rules and determine whether my products are soluble or insoluble. Our first product is potassium chloride. So we look for either a potassium ion or a chloride ion in the first column. And of course, we see potassium in the very first row. Compounds containing alkali metal cations like potassium are soluble. And we look over for exceptions. There are absolutely no exceptions, which means that KCl uh, is actually going to be aqueous 
because it's soluble in water. Then we continue with our second product and we look for either a barium ion or a sulfate ion in the first column. And as I look down this list looking for either one, I finally find sulfate down at the bottom of the water soluble compounds. So compounds containing sulfate are generally soluble, but there are exceptions here. And I can see right away that when sulfate is actually combined with a barium ion, it is considered an insoluble exception. So this is going to be my precipitate. This is the solid. Now that we have the correct formulas for our products, as well as appropriate states, we have to complete our ionic equation. So in order to do this, we take the aqueous products and break it apart into the dissociated ions. So we break apart potassium chloride into two potassium ions and two chloride ions. Since barium sulfate is a solid, it doesn't dissociate, so the formula remains as a whole, not dissociated ions. We're next going to eliminate our spectator ions from the complete ionic equation. So I look for anything that occurs in the same ionic form on either side, and I first see potassium. Our two potassium ions are on both sides, and then our two chloride ions are also on both sides. These are the spectator ions. They're going to be eliminated from the net ionic equation. And that ionic equation represents the heart of this, or the driving force of this particular reaction, between barium ions and sulfate ions in solution, forming insoluble barium sulfate. Let's look at another example. This time we're going to predict the products and states for the reaction between sodium nitrate and ammonium carbonate. So the first step is again to predict the products. So I'm going to separate my reactants into their dissociated ion form. And again, I use what I know about uh, charges for ions and charge balance. So sodium is in column one. It always forms ions with a plus one charge. So I know I have a plus one on sodium. What remains in that formula Everything that comes after the sodium is NO3. That's a nitrate anion. It's a polyatomic. And for charge balance, if sodium is plus one, nitrate must be negative one. I look at ammonium carbonate and I see the same basic idea. This time I know because of the parentheses that ammonium is a polyatomic group. It's my cation. And I also can look up on my list of polyatomics the charge on ammonium, and I find it's always a plus one. So I have two as a subscript. That becomes the coefficient, and plus one becomes the charge. Carbonate is the remainder of that formula, and that polyatomic always has a negative two charge. So I have my combinations of dissociated ions, my next step is going to be to switch the cations and have them react with the anion from the other reactant compound. So sodium is going to combine with carbonate and ammonium is going to combine with nitrate. Now again, I'm going to write the correct chemical formula um, showing the lowest whole number ratio. For sodium and carbonate, when I do a crisscross of that, it actually turns out that I need two sodiums to balance the carbonate anion, so I get an Na2CO3 for my first formula. For ammonium and nitrate, it's a plus one and minus one charge. I write the ammonium first because it's the cation, followed by the nitrate, and it's NH4NO3. Now I do have a two on the uh, um, as a coefficient, so I'm going to balance that by putting a 2 in front of my ammonium nitrate formula. And what that means is that I'm going to also have to put a 2 in front of the sodium nitrate on the other side. And that actually works out because I had had to increase the number of sodium in the products to 2 as well. Now that I have the correct formulas, I'm going to use my solubility rules to determine which of these products are soluble or insoluble. 
So we'll start with our first product, sodium carbonate. We'll look for either a sodium or a carbonate ion in the first column of the periodic table. I see the sodium first, and it tells me that compounds containing alkali metal cations like sodium are water soluble. And I look over to the right to see if there are any exceptions, and there are none. So sodium carbonate must be aqueous, AQ. I do the same thing for the ammonium nitrate. I look for either ammonium or nitrate. I find the ammonium first, and it's in the same row as the sodium. So ammonium-containing compounds are soluble with no exceptions. So again, it's AQ. Now that I have the correct formulas and the correct state for both of my products, I just need to complete the ionic and net ionic equations. So I'm going to separate anything in the product side that contains AQ into its dissociated ions. Well, that's both of my products. So I break that apart again into two sodium ions and a carbonate ion, and my ammonium nitrate into two ammonium and two nitrate ions. And next, I want to eliminate the spectator ions so I can focus just on the net ionic equation. So I look for things that are present in the same form on both sides. And here's sodium. And then there's nitrate. Here's ammonium. And then there's carbonate. Everything got eliminated. The dissociated ions remain dissociated in this particular chemical reaction, which means that there's actually no change. In other words, there's no reaction. If I were to mix two solutions of sodium nitrate and ammonium carbonate, I would see absolutely nothing happen. And here's the key thing with double displacement reactions. They are driven by the formation of a product that is not aqueous. And in the case of a precipitation reaction, that means a solid. And if no solid forms, then there is no reaction. So in summary, in precipitation reactions, two aqueous reactants combine to produce a solid precipitate as a product. Precipitation reactions are usually double displacement reactions of ionic compounds in which cations switch places to form new products. Solubility rules help us predict whether an ionic compound will be soluble or insoluble in an aqueous reaction.